everyone and welcome to this Young Rail Professional Scotland event today with Bill Reeve, the Rail Director of Transport Scotland, um, who's going to be talking to us about Scottish decarbonisation. Um, so what we're going to do is have a 40 to 45 minute presentation from Bill and then there'll be chance for a Q&A session and you can add your questions um, to the questions poll or um, questions tab or into the chat. Um, and we can ask those at the end. So feel free to post questions um, all the way through and uh, we'll pick them up at the end of the session. But I'll pass over to Bill now um, and we'll get started. Thank you. Um, so I'm hoping uh, that you can see a, uh, a, a slide of um, a title which says Transport Scotland Scottish Decarbonisation and a picture of the rather splendid fourth bridge. Um, when I was asked to um, uh, would I talk to the young rail professionals that was a bit of a no-brainer for me. Um, I really admire the work that the YRP does uh, and for those of you who are taking the time to develop your knowledge and, uh, and therefore your career by engaging in YRP activity well done. I've got a huge amount out of uh, engaging with uh, rail professionals beyond my immediate work environment through the years. In my case, done a lot through the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Um, but that chance to get out and see more than your immediate environment is hugely valuable. And Scottish Government spends more than a billion pounds a year on the railways of Scotland. So this is a big deal for us, literally, in every, every, every respect. Um, and uh, we really want to be dealing with uh, delivery partners in the rail industry who understand how the railway works as a system, understand how the engineering and the operations connect to the commerce and the economy and the impact on society. So YRP is a great, uh, a great body for delivering um, exactly that sort of understanding. Um, now I'm told uh, that there's some 50 or 60 of you uh, this evening. Oh, I see we're up to 69, in fact. Uh, and uh, I'm told that you will be, uh, although this event is put on by um, the uh, Scotland YRP, uh, that I should expect an audience uh, of a slightly wider geographic um, location. So I will, for those of you in Scotland who know a number of these things already, I apologise in advance, but for the guests uh, to, uh, to, 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 to hear what it is that we're doing in Team Scotland, uh, then um, I will try and explain that as we go along. Um, normally in a presentation, I'd, be see, I'd see your faces, see whether you were falling asleep, yawning, uh, uh, or, or not understanding a word that I'm saying. Um, uh, so I don't think there's any way of questions being asked as we go through. We'll have to, 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 to wait at the end, but I look forward to that uh, interchange at the end. So without further ado, just a, uh, without further ado, the presentation has ceased. Oh, there we go. So um, what is the context in which we're approaching rail decarbonisation um, and indeed what's the context in which we're approaching management of transport uh, and rail within that transport mix? Um, it would be really odd wouldn't it if I said nothing about the impact of Covid at the moment. Um, so uh, these are these there's a picture of the first minister uh, as when she was uh, and, and some extracts from uh, the First Minister's program for government, which was announced uh, earlier this year in the autumn of this year, program for government is the equivalent of the Queen's speech for the Scottish Parliament. It's where the government sets out its program for the next year, and clearly it can't be a normal program for government. Uh, the reality of the uh, health, economic, social impacts of COVID uh, are driving a huge amount of everything we have to do, um, but one of the things about being in government is you have to manage the issues of the moment you have to look to the future as well how are we going to build back uh, a fairer and stronger society and economy in scotland um uh, we have uh, in scotland the purpose of the scottish government has long been expressed as the promotion of sustainable and inclusive economic growth for communities throughout scotland and everything that we do in transport scotland uh, which is the 
the transport agency of the Scottish Government, so we are the DFT of the Scottish Government in essence, and we're also interesting the highways agency of the Scottish Government, so we run the trunk road system as well, uh, and we fund the uh, uh, about 50% of the bus industry turnover, and we own a few airports, uh, and even own a couple of aircraft that are used for um, uh, connectivity to remote communities. Uh, so in, in essence, if it moves in Scotland one way or another, we're probably paying for at least part of it. Um, but everything that we are doing has to support that purpose of promoting uh, sustainable and inclusive economic growth for communities throughout Scotland. And so as we are managing the railway system of Scotland, we have to work out how we're going to, to use it in the future when we get past COVID-19 to deliver that greener, fairer and more prosperous Scotland. And um, we have all had a, a focus on the importance of climate change for some while now. The high level output specification of the Scottish Government, and because we fund a network rail in Scotland and we specify its activities in Scotland in a separate document from the, uh, uh, from the one that the UK Government issues for the railways of England and network rail in Wales. So in the Scottish high level output specification, we included the requirement to address uh, uh, climate change and to adapt the system to be able to cope with climate change. Um, tragically, at Stonehaven, or just south of Stonehaven at Carmont recently, uh, the reality of climate change was brought home to the railway family in Scotland when we lost the lives of two of our team members and one passenger in the first accident, uh, a fatal accident on the railway for some 13 years. Um, and that was caused by heavy rainfall and it's a feature of climate change that um, we are getting a larger number of extreme weather events uh, than before that's a quite discernible trend in the statistics and for us in Scotland interestingly that trend is accelerating faster than it is south of the border we are getting not only are we getting more severe weather events uh, but the rate at which they are increasing is increasing faster than further south. So um, climate change uh, is a reality we cannot ignore. It is an unavoidable priority for us, even whilst we are wrestling with the immediate challenges of COVID. So the Scottish Government uh, has a set of policies joined up across all of its activity uh, with a real focus on um, climate change. Uh, we passed uh, climate change legislation that's amongst the most ambitious in the world. Uh, we have net zero emission targets to benefit the environment, people and indeed the economy. Uh, and we have uh, a target for net zero emissions on all greenhouse gases um, that's more ambitious than the rest of the UK. Um, uh, we have a, a, a programme uh, to deliver that across transport. Um, uh, and the National Transport Strategy, which has just been uh, issued again only last year, uh, uh, contains within it as a big part of our strategy across all transport modes, the commitment to sustainable transport. And we, are, we will be publishing shortly the first part of our Strategic Transport Projects Review, which is how we're going to allocate our investment in support of that transport strategy. Uh, and, and that requires us to look ahead for the next 20 years to future-proof Scotland's railway and for, uh, to make certain that the railway is playing its part in addressing that climate change agenda. Uh, so our national transport strategy contains some important principles. Uh, what are we trying to achieve through the transport strategy? We're trying to reduce inequalities for communities throughout Scotland and use transport. Transport connects communities with opportunities for employment, for education, for leisure, for healthcare, and just uh, to connect with families. Um, and we want to do that in an equitable, equitable manner so that, uh, that all communities are benefiting from that transport provision. Uh, we absolutely need to have our transport system focused on addressing the climate challenge. Um, it needs to support a developing economy in an inclusive and sustainable manner. And, and it needs to improve our health and well-being. And uh, aside from the climate impact of, uh, uh, of um, uh, that leads to the need for decarbonisation, closely linked to that is the issue of emissions from transport. 
uh, and uh, there is a growing amount of evidence about the impact of transport related emissions on the health of communities in cities and in towns um, and um, uh, so our decarbonisation is focused both on addressing the climate issue and on addressing the health and well-being issue of, uh, of emissions in cities, as well as the health and well-being of encouraging people to, to take a little bit more exercise in their, in their daily lives and to live in a manner that will support their health and well-being. So uh, consistent with that, we have a transport hierarchy. Uh, we want to encourage walking and wheeling. Uh, and cycling, so active travel is where we start as our preferred mode of transport. After that, we want people to use public transport, particularly for those longer journeys or for those who are less able. Um, taxis and shared transport would be next on the list. And last, in terms of uh, our preferred travel for individuals, is the private car, uh, which is kind of the worst of all options in terms of uh, uh, congestion, quality of life, emissions, um, it's uh, and even uh, use of, of valuable things like road space. So um, uh, that's uh, our approach to the strategy, to our priorities and our hierarchy with respect to transport. So what role does transport play in emissions within Scotland? Uh, so worryingly, um, transport accounts for 37% of the greenhouse gases uh, em emitted uh, in Scotland. That's uh, broadly similar to, to, to the percentage across all of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and within that, rail uh, only accounts for 1.2% of those emissions. So you might say, well, uh, why bother then? What, why, why is decarbonising rail important? Well, let's just stop and, and think for a moment. Um, in a number of the other sectors of the economy, we know what we can do in order to decarbonize. We've made huge strides, for example, in energy generation, where we have, uh, where wind generated uh, uh, electricity is now the cheapest form of electricity, as well as being the cleanest form of electricity. Um, uh, and, and when we look across the, the entirety of the economy and society, we've got a lot of good solutions to a lot of the emissions um, uh, that are created, and other sectors have made substantial improvements, but transport has remained stubbornly at around this level of pollution. So we need to change transport. We need to change it fundamentally to address the climate change and the clean air challenge. And all of the analysis that we do makes clear that we will only change, and we'll only hit our climate change targets if we get behavior change in terms of the type of transport that people choose. So it's not when we set out to decarbonize railway that we are trying especially to get rid of the 1.2% of emissions. <clears throat> what we're really trying to get rid of is a big chunk of the 40% of emissions that are coming from the private car uh, and the 25% of those emissions that are coming from heavy goods vehicles and from light vans. Uh, and so modal shift is a huge bit of what has to drive our investment strategy for the transport system of Scotland. Um, so we have plans across all of our transport. We, are, we have plans to phase out uh, new petrol and diesel cars by 2032 in Scotland. We are introducing low emission zones in the cities of Scotland, starting with conversion of the buses to electric or low emission diesel initially. Uh, we have got plans to decarbonize aviation, uh, including uh, decarbonizing our airports and for some of our shorter community uh, connectivity flights, um, particularly to some of the island communities, uh, we are we are pressing ahead, uh, looking to pilot electric aviation on, on uh, over distances where that is technically viable. Um, we are uh, accelerating the deployment of zero emission buses across Scotland. Uh, Aberdeen has had the world's largest fleet of hydrogen buses. Um, uh, I think it may have been overtaken recently, but there's plans for further investment in fuel cell buses. Um, but for the purposes of the uh, young rail professionals, we are focused here on decarbonizing passenger rail services and indeed freight uh, services by 2035, 
uh, a good five years ahead of the rest of the UK uh, because uh, we believe that's important and because having thought about it we believe it's possible. So for those of you not familiar with Scotland's railway perhaps just a little bit of context here is one of those extraordinarily dull slides with an awful lot of numbers on it which you may read at your leisure but broadly uh, what you need to know is uh, that the railway of Scotland is around about 11 percent of the GB railway by just about any measure uh, and there is actually quite a lot of it there's quite a lot of Scotland so there's quite a lot of the railway um, uh, railway activity on the passenger railway is focused in the central belt of Scotland between Edinburgh and Glasgow um, and the greater area around that but of course we also have important uh, uh, trunk routes to the connecting the seven cities of Scotland to Inverness to Aberdeen Dundee Perth Stirling as well as Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, and we have our absolutely splendid scenic railways uh, to the West Highlands to Kyle Loch Alsh to Stranra uh, and to the far north of Scotland, to Caithness, uh, to Wick and Thurso. Uh, and they play an important part in community connectivity and they're also an important part of having a sustainable transport offer for tourists, which is a significant bit of the Scottish economy. Um, uh, I suspect that, uh, oh no, this slide has been updated. We now have 360 stations. We've opened another one just a couple of weeks ago. We opened another one um, uh, in Rob Royston uh, in the suburbs of Glasgow in December last year, so less than a year ago. So we've had a steady uh, um, habit and indeed a policy of expanding the railways, uh, including, uh, for those of you uh, who may not know, the reopening of the railways to the borders, which has been a fantastic success, connecting the communities of the borders with opportunities that weren't available to them without that railway connection. Um, and if you want to know what we think are the important priorities for the railway system in the round, then I do recommend to you the Scottish Government's high level output statement. There are always lots of acronyms, aren't there, when dealing with railways, the uh, the HLOS. Um, but the ABC of our HLOS can be summarised as A for alignment, B for building on success and C for a competitive railway. Um, the alignment bit is important. We spend over a billion pounds a year on the railways of Scotland. We want to make certain that uh, our partners in Network Rail and Scott Rail and the Caledonian Sleeper in uh, spending that money on our behalf are doing so in a manner that aligns to our strategic priorities. And indeed, we put a lot of effort into ensuring that our contracts and regulatory frameworks allow them to be aligned with each other because we find that uh, goes a long way to avoid the problems that the current rail industry structure can create. We want to build on the success of the railway. We have had until COVID a growing railway, uh, both in passenger and in freight. Uh, and uh, we want to build on that success and make the most of the railway system we already have. And we will only achieve that if we focus on a competitive railway. Now, one of the, the bizarre features of the privatised rail industry structure is it disconnects an awful lot of rail professionals from the reality of revenue from passengers and freight customers. We will only succeed if we offer passenger and freight services that passengers and freight customers want to use. We have a very good road network in Scotland. People can drive, uh, lorries can move goods unless we offer competitively priced and attractive services we will not persuade people to use that railway the railway works in a competitive environment for transport and indeed in a competitive environment for the allocation of government funding so uh, in order to deliver those attractive services a competitive railway has to be delivered efficiently uh, now now uh, that relates directly to the issue of decarbonisation and electrification because an electric railway is cheaper to operate uh, attracts and attracts more revenue. It ticks both of those boxes of a competitive railway. It allows us to offer more competitive services and it allows us to do so in a cost effective manner. And our HSOS included expressly a requirement for Network Rail to develop. Um, an efficient approach to electrification in, Sco uh, in Scotland, to organise to deliver a rolling programme of electrification uh, and to ensure that related technical strategies like gauging and 
um, signalling are all adding up to that aligned investment programme for the delivery of a competitive railway. Um, uh, we have, oh dear, some of these some of these acronyms are just deathly dull, aren't they? I mean, RECIS, goodness me. Um, anyway, never mind. Um, the, the letters may be dull, but what it does is important. Um, so the rail enhancements and capital investment strategy is all about uh, developing a pipeline of projects because we know that uh, stop-start program of investment will never deliver things efficiently. Uh, it, looking at the whole life costs, and I don't buy that, but this is particularly addressed to my network rail colleagues. Network rail talks a lot about whole life costs, but all it means when it talks about that typically is uh, relating capital costs of infrastructure to the maintenance costs of infrastructure. What we are interested in is the investment uh, program that will deliver the best return in terms of revenue, uh, as well as wider economic benefits for the whole railway system cost. Uh, so our understanding of whole life costs is an awful lot broader than is sometimes talked about in some parts of the railway industry. Um, we will we will invest where interventions are value for money we do believe it's important to maintain steady work banks because that promotes really good employment opportunities so if we can create good jobs in in scotland by the money we spend on railways that makes gets our makes our our government money work twice uh, uh and we're keen to see innovation that delivers that efficiency and we think very importantly about the railway as a system one of the uh, uh, difficulties of the current privatised railway structure is that we end up with people in silos uh, and infrastructure managers will always imagine investment means infrastructure uh, and train operators will think that timetable and rolling stock is all about winning franchise bids on occasions. But if we want to move the railway system from state A to state B uh, to deliver a set of outputs, the most efficient way of doing that requires us to, to iterate between options for the timetable, the service we deliver, the rolling stock we use to deliver it and the infrastructure. And we work across Team Scotland to, to consider our investments in that joined up fashion. That might sound obvious, but let me assure you from experience elsewhere, that's not how it's always done. So that's a vitally important bit of, uh, of how we get the best, uh, the best value for the money we spend. What is our route to decarbonisation? Well, you may have seen it reported that in Scotland, we spell uh, decarbonise E-L-E-C-T-R-I-F-Y, electrify. So let me uh, explain a little bit why. Um, uh, I mentioned that even in the midst of COVID, we are having to look to the future. And I was delighted, therefore, that we published our decarbonisation action plan for Scotland's railway at the end of July. It was actually ready to go uh, in the middle of March, and we were just looking for a suitable date to get the right um, uh, the right sort of publicity around it when we had to go into lockdown. Um, uh, and of course, one might have thought that that would just be put on the back burner and we wouldn't be worrying about that till later. But this is so important that our ministers were extremely keen that we publish this commitment to decarbonisation of Scotland's railway, uh, even whilst we were dealing with the challenges of COVID. Um, this will require us uh, by 2035 to have moved away from a reliance on diesel traction to green sources of electric battery and fuel cell. Um, but for reasons I'll come on to explain, uh, the principal aim of this strategy is to electrify the network. Um, at the margins of the network, uh, we see a future for fuel cells as a technology which shows promise. It's not mature yet, but it shows promise. Uh, and we think battery technology is already uh, in a usable form. Um, and both of those will help us in transition to the electrified railway network that we want. Um, but uh, we should never lose sight of the main goal because that's the one that delivers us a more efficient railway. And why electrify? Well, I think we've covered a lot of this already, um, but electric rail uh, delivers huge advantages. Of course, it is a low carbon mode. And when we connect uh, our electrification policy to the power generation policy of the Scottish government, we end up with zero emission transport. 
um, uh, and we also use that that power that is generated very efficiently. Um, uh, of course, railways connect communities and reduce inequalities, and they connect goods and, and people, um, and they provide a fundamentally safe means of travel, uh, and that's why actually the events at Stonehaven were so shocking for us, because railways are still the safest form of travel around Scotland. Um, so, uh, but why electric rail in particular? Well, it drives down the unit cost of the operation of trains. An electric train like that class 385 you see in the picture there uh, is uh, cheaper to buy uh, than a diesel train or indeed a fuel cell train or a battery train. It's cheaper to operate than those alternatives. It performs better than those alternatives. You're looking at a picture of the most reliable new train in Britain, that, uh, that 385. Um, and when you turn to the freight railway, uh, it is the case that it's it, that it's that there is no uh, plausible alternative to an electric locomotive for the haulage of serious tonnages um, uh, over long distances, nor indeed is there a credible alternative for the high power requirements of uh, intercity high speed passenger trains. So we know that uh, that the electric railway will deliver the outputs we need uh, and to do to take us to that lower cost, higher revenue railway. Um, uh, we have actually understood that for some while, and whilst debates have raged elsewhere about whether electrification is a good thing or not, somewhat bizarrely, um, uh, we have just quietly been getting on with it. Um, we've delivered in the last five years 325 single track kilometers of uh, new electrification. Uh, all of the five routes between Edinburgh and Glasgow are now electrified. Um, uh, surely, no, I haven't seen that, 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 that claim inserted on this slide, but I suspect it's true, the best connected city pairing in the UK. Um, and that's not because we need five routes to get from Edinburgh to Glasgow, it's because the communities that exist between Edinburgh and Glasgow deserve efficient, high quality, sustainable emission free transport to connect them to Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, uh, so we're very pleased that 76% of all Scottish rail passenger journeys are now uh, electrically hauled uh, and 40, actually I think that figures out of date, I think it's nearer 49% of freight journeys are now currently undertaken uh, with electric locomotives. Um, what we are uh, missing uh, on the freight journeys in particular uh, is not electrification to some of the key freight terminals within Scotland because we do that as part of our passenger electrification schemes as a deliberate policy. It's actually um, electrification of short sections of railway in England, like for example the line from Ipswich to Felixstowe Docks, which is the biggest container port in Britain, or indeed to Teesport, which is one of the major um, uh, tonnage, or I think we have a, 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 a long-term resident of Kingston-upon-Hull, Hull and indeed on the south side of the Humber, Immingham and Grimsby uh, are uh, move some of the biggest tonnage um, uh, through the ports in Britain, but they are uh, tantalizingly removed from the electric network. So freight trains running to and from those destinations end up being hauled by diesels for the, for the complete length of their haul for want of a small number of miles um, on those important key freight connections. Um, and that interestingly means that they can't accelerate as quickly, they can't run at quite the same top speed, they therefore take up more capacity on the mixed traffic railway that we have, um, uh, and none of that is sensible in terms of efficient use of capacity, or indeed in terms of securing the market share that rail freight must secure if we're going to reduce emissions from HGVs. Um, this is the electrification network that we currently have, um, which has expanded a lot in the last five years, uh, particularly in the central belt. Um, uh, these are, is a list of the schemes we have delivered in recent years, uh, so we know how to do this, but we also know there are more lessons to learn. Um, we need to uh, reduce the cost of electrification. It is still not as uh, cheap to deliver electrification in Britain as it is elsewhere uh, in Europe, looking at benchmarks, or indeed as it has been in Britain, allowing for inflation. Um, and 
uh, we have made progress uh, on the learning by doing approach uh, with our rolling program of electrification in driving down those costs but I'm still being presented with estimates that are in the two or even three million pounds per single track kilometer um, because they are they contain uh, a number of suboptimal features in the design too much of an allowance and acceptance for risk uh, and we have to as the railway community rise to the challenge of delivering bulk standard electrification systems are around the one million pound per single track kilometer level if we are to realize the potential of the railway to make that wider contribution um, uh, is that a challenging target yes is it possible absolutely it's what's done elsewhere and i know when i look at the the electrification systems we have had to pay for about the the level of inefficiency which we've had to pay for poor quality assurance uh, over complicated procurement strategies over specified electrification systems mass spacing is is uh, is tighter than it, it used to be uh, for no reason that i have been able to discern that makes any sense um, and mass spacing drives the amount of time you have to disrupt the railway that the closer your masts are uh, the more time you have to spend installing masts the longer you're disrupting the existing railway whilst you're doing the electrification so it's a big driver of costs um, we should just say that we need to be careful in addressing the diesel dilemma uh, in the short run. Um, we want to get rid of our diesel trains by 2035, but it's still I would still far rather that someone that a passenger was travelling on a diesel train than in a private car, and I'd still far rather that uh, freight was being moved behind a diesel locomotive than on a diesel-powered HGV. So. We will need to uh, to use our diesels to help decarbonize through modal shift uh, in that transition period, and we can do more uh, to control the emissions from those diesels whilst we are doing so. But I am sure that we need to get rid of them because I don't think it will be acceptable in 15 years' time to be running diesel engines in uh, city centres, and I really don't want the last place it's possible to see a diesel engine in Glasgow uh, to be underneath a train uh, in one of our stations. Um, so I think we've covered a lot of this ground already. Um, uh, we are looking at discontinuous electrification. It's got a role to play in transition and a role to play in some of our branches at the margins. Um, uh, but as I think I've already explained, uh, for our busy routes, for our trunk routes, full electrification is the right answer. Uh, this is the plan we have at the minute. Uh, the red lines on the right there are uh, the extent of the network of the full electrification we expect by 2035. The yellow lines are the routes we intend to electrify, but uh, uh, we think we'll still need a transition solution by that point, just because of the pace with which we can roll out the electrification. And the green routes are the ones where the alternative traction, the, that mix of batteries and fuel cells, is likely to be necessary in the longer run and important they will be too. Um, the work is underway, we're not just talking about this, we uh, in last year's 20, 20, 2019's programme for government, uh, the First Minister committed us to the electrification of the East Kilbride and Barhead routes, uh, some of the busiest remaining diesel railway in Scotland to the south of Glasgow. Um, uh, and we And how will we do this? We will do this as Team Scotland in a collaborative approach, working in partnership between government, train operators, uh, the uh, network rail, and indeed the supply base uh, to Team Scotland. Um, uh, I've mentioned uh, uh, our decarbonisation action plan. Uh, I would want to draw your attention to Network Rail's traction decarbonisation network strategy, another less than snappy acronym. Um, it's an important bit of work. It's got some good work around the business case for electrification. Uh, we have contributed to that. We've been involved with that. Um, uh, and I recommend, if you haven't read it, I do recommend that you should do so. But I would just say to you uh, that uh, the Transtraction Decarbonisation Network Strategy 
is a recommendation by Network Rail and the rail industry to, well, chiefly the UK government. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, Rail Decarbonisation Action Plan is an instruction from government to the Railway Agency of Scotland to get on and deliver a decarbonised railway. And a recommendation to government and an instruction from government are really not quite the same thing. Um, so, as we invest, it's worth mentioning that we will create jobs, we will stimulate innovation, uh, we will look to create a sustainable supply base for what we do in Scotland, uh, and we will work in partnership with Scottish Enterprise to try and promote that uh, rail cluster of manufacturing and innovation within Scotland. And why uh, will we do that and what will it all look like? At the end of this, a decarbonised electric railway will deliver improved journey times that will persuade more people out of their cars and more goods out of their lorries uh, onto rail. It will deliver that more reliably, which will again make it more attractive. It will facilitate for the same cost additional services on those routes where additional demand is, is needed. Uh, and electrification, we are sure, is the route to secure that. Um, I hope that's been of interest to you. Bizarrely, I have no way of telling because I can't see any of your faces, uh, but I hope perhaps we might move to um, a little bit less impersonal screen view shortly. Uh, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. How did I do? How was I for time? That was that was brilliant, Bill. So you are dead on for 40 minutes um, and we have had questions come into the box. So um, you can either keep your slides up or, or close them if you'd like to. Um, ah, and you're confusing I'll me with someone who's competent. How do I close them? <laughs> um, I'm not. No, sure. not that button. Maybe we'll leave them <laughs> up. That'll be, that'll be the best way to do it. Oh no, you, you've turned your own camera off now. Never mind. Uh, um, I would like to say thank you um, for your kind <laughs> words about YRP. Um, at the start, it's 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 um, really good to have had you uh, come and talk to our members today, um, and yeah, we really appreciate your support. Um, so oh, without way, further ado, there we go. Moving on to um, some of the questions that we've had in. Um, First of all, um, from from Jenny Cook, um, she said that um, sustainable economic growth is is mentioned a lot, um, but questions whether you think that growth is a valid goal for us um, as a country that already uses um, significant resources um, globally, and and whether or not we should be aiming for for more inclusive prosperity mm -hmm. that focuses on reducing inequality and and enabling people to thrive, um, regardless of I suppose GDP is, as a measure. Um, so a bit of a context one, but I'd like to see your thoughts on that. Wow. Well, um, uh, that's that would be a whole series of lectures in its in, in its own right, wouldn't it? But it but is a really important question. I mean, I would stress we're talking about sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Um, and 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 look, I I it's not inevitable to me that total demand for transport grows that what i should have put up in that transport hierarchy you know the best journey is the journey avoided um uh, in a lot of cases and and it's interesting isn't it that we have learnt during covid uh, that we can work from home uh, for a large part of what we do um or some of us have at least um uh, for others that 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 still isn't true and essential journeys are still essential we still do need uh, essential workers to get to key locations. Uh, we still need the goods that we consume, even at a basic level like food, to be delivered to us. Uh, we are absolutely in favour of localism. Uh, we like the idea of distributing uh, economic activity around the country in a manner where people can do what they need to do within that sort of 20 minute uh, environment. All of those are really important policy goals. but but for those of us responsible for transport i mean i see a future in which for example there will be less uh commuting we what we've seen in covid is it's been accelerating trends that are already discernible so whereas a few years ago monday and friday were the busiest days of the week on transport network uh, for the last couple of years that hasn't been true Tuesdays and Thursdays have become busier, Mondays and Fridays have started to ease off a bit, 
um, uh, because people have already started to work from home. Um, we've also seen during COVID uh, the demand for rail freight pick up far faster than for passengers. Um, so I think what's important going back to the environmental imperative is even when I look to a future where uh, total transport demand has gone down because that's that in the round is 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 a better future uh, there will still be a need for transport and we need to deliver that sustainably uh, and if I if I look for example at, at things like the tourist market um, uh, we are seeing the roads of Scotland busier than ever with people during staycations or getting out to exercise in the hills uh, which is great, but I'd far rather they were doing that through sustainable transport with an integrated public transport system. So we've got to think about, given that there will always be some need for transport, about how we deliver that efficiently and sustainably in a manner that includes the communities that it serves. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a really good point, and and I think what you're saying about people going out and, and for leisure and, and using their cars and things. Um, to go to more rural locations, so this isn't a, a question on the list now, um, but how is Transport Scotland looking at tackling that sort of first and last mile issue, especially oh, in rural point. areas when it's not just a mile? You know, if you great live 20 point. miles from the train station um, or 30 miles from the train station, how, how, how would you encourage people to use rail as opposed to to private transport I suppose great great, great, great <laughs> question. and 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 one frankly i i don't think we have done enough yet about i uh, uh so there aren't many people who live at railway stations um so most journeys are uh start with travel to the station and 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 finish with a journey from a station um uh, in that sense uh transport scotland uh if you go back to that transport hierarchy i showed We've put a lot of effort into promoting active travel. One of those trends that we have been pleased to see accelerated during COVID has been a real growth in active travel. And um, we put money into reallocating road space in our in our towns and cities, the Spaces for People program, uh, precisely to facilitate walking and cycling. I was, I was in my bike shop yesterday because um, actually I've worn out the pedal on my bike. Um, and uh, and I was told that if I wanted to buy a new bike, uh, come back next August. So it's it's good to see that that, and that's really exciting for for those of us in the railway industry because uh, what what bikes do is they double the effective radius that is served by a station. You can cycle broadly twice as far as you can walk, um, and if we double the radius that's served by a station, when we quadruple the catchment area. And that's just great news in terms of moving towards sustainable travel. Um, uh, there is a role for cycling in 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 uh, on our tourist railways, not least because cycling is a substantial leisure activity. And those of you who may live in London, I commend uh, take your take your mountain bike, put it on the sleeper, come to Fort William, cycle along the Great Glen to Inverness, and go back by sleeper. Um, why not? It's a brilliant thing to do. Because uh, the alternative is cycling around Regent's Park, and that's really not quite the same as uh, as 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 the, as the experience we can offer you here in Scotland. Um, but the the uh, we really have to work to improve the network of public transport in our rural areas. Uh, and um, uh, I, I I that's why when I was asked to 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 start a project called our, our West Highland Review uh, uh, project, uh, I was in I was. Uh, determined that would make it the West Highland Network Review rather than West Highland Line Review because the bus links between Fort William and Oban are as important as the railways to Fort William and Oban. Uh, and there are aspects of the way in which the transport industry is structured in Britain which makes it uniquely difficult to do that joining up. Um, and these are legacy issues of, of, uh, of typically of UK government uh, policies in, in previous years. But, but I look to a benchmark like Switzerland. Uh, by the way, if the YRP isn't organizing tours to see best practice in Swiss railways, you jolly well should. Um, uh, because there I travel on uh, a connected network of post buses, ferries on the lakes, uh, trams and buses in cities, railways, all with integrated timetables, all with integrated ticketing. And it's no surprise, is it, 
that public transport's market share with a connected network of that character is higher in Switzerland than it is in other countries around Europe. So we've got a lot to learn from some of those models and we are cracking on with trying to deliver them, but a long way to go. Okay, thank you, Bill. That was that was a question I snuck in there, so I'll get to the ones that are in the chat. That's um, chairman's privilege. That's, sort of, that's absolutely allowed. Yeah. There's, there's quite a lot to get through, so um. Okay. Uh, I hope hopefully we can we can get through it. But um, one question here from um David Shires is, um, when Edinburgh to Glasgow main line was electrified, um, did passenger traffic increase? And and he thinks it would be useful to know that as evidence of, of modal shift. So. Was that a trend that was identified? Uh, well, well uh, good evening, Mr. Shiraz. Um, I admire your chutzpah in joining the young rail professionals. For those of you, those of you who don't know David, he is a, um, uh, I, would, I would say more of learned professor status than uh, than, than, than young rail professional. But um, uh, if, if you haven't read some of David's articles on things like decarbonisation, different strategies in rail engineer, then, then I recommend you should. I, I can, I can honestly say David's contribution has been policy forming on occasion. So um, delighted to have you have you watching, David. Um, the, the the short answer to your question about did electrification on the Edinburgh Glasgow route result in an increase in traffic is uh, we had a decrease in traffic during the disruption of electrification, which is why it's so important that we improve the efficiency with which we electrify and do not put more masts in than are strictly necessary. Um, to take but one topical example, uh, but in the period when we uh, uh, commissioned the electric railway, in that, that halcyon period between the completion of the electrification and the start of lockdown, uh, traffic was increasing really quite rapidly and noticeably, as was passenger satisfaction. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, so we have seen a discernible uplift and that sparks effect. It's, it's something I probably hinted at rather than talked about. Uh, but transport planners and economists have observed what they call the sparks effect, uh, where railways are electrified. Uh, you normally see an uplift in patronage uh, and you see, interestingly, an increase in the value of property in and around, sta and around stations on electrified railways. So we know that it is valued. And that's why it has this magic property of both reducing the cost of operation of the railway and increasing the revenue that we get from that railway. Okay, brilliant. I think that answered the question. And apologies, um, David, for mispronouncing your your surname. Um, just jumping in, there's another question. There was a question here about um, those masks, as you say, which is somewhere down the bottom. Um, this is from Chris Jackson, um, who asks whether the concern over closer mass spacing, um, does it relate to the provision of resilience against future climate change? Is there anything anything in that or any reasoning for extra masks um, or not? Um, well, none that I have been able to discern. Um, so, so if you, if you, I mean, one of the most embarrassing uh, uh, bits of engineering I have seen in recent years is the electrification system of the Great Western Main Line. It is gobsmackingly awful. It is it is a disgrace. And I speak as a as a, as a railway engineer. Uh, I am embarrassed that the railway engineering profession could have produced a design as unnecessarily expensive as that. Um, take a look at the uh, the electrification design on some of the Lina Grand Vitesse in France. And there you will see um, uh, electrification designed to support uh, TGVs in multiple unit operation. So that which I am told is utterly impossible to cope with high speed, two high speed pantographs on the same train. Um, uh, it is a far more elegant design. It is, a, it, it is installed with an awful lot less fuss. Uh, and we would do very well to remind ourselves of that. Uh, and, and there is no excuse for the scale of foundations that were driven, uh, that were deemed to be necessary for the Great Western electrification, um, grossly over-designed. Um, uh, and, and, and that set back the cause of electrification. You know, the, the UK government, which had committed to electrification, found itself with this runaway cost of an electrification scheme 
uh, and the tragedy is electrification was blamed rather than the ineptitude of those responsible for that project. So I, I'm really, I feel quite passionately angry about how badly that was delivered because uh, England deserves a better railway than that. Uh, and it was the failure of railway professionals to deliver a scheme efficiently that set back the cause of electrification uh, in, in the mind of the UK government. So this stuff really does matter. Engineering really does matter and it has to be efficient. There is not a magic money tree that will pay for this stuff, uh, how unnecessarily badly it is designed. I think I think that the point that you're making about runaway schemes and things being expensive is is to some extent being addressed by the, the rolling programme and there's a recognition yeah. that the, the cost has to come down um, and the expertise needs to be maintained and you would hope that those lessons learned will, will be imported. Um, so, Moving on to the next question, um, Lorena Muskai says, thank you for the presentation. And um, what do you think will be the biggest challenge in decarbonizing the passenger rail services by 2035? And, and how will it be overcome? Oh, crikey. I think it's probably that 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 we've just been talked about. It's uh, we need to crack, we need to deliver efficiently a steady amount of electrification every year. The way in Britain we have organized electrification is by a series of discrete projects, each of which has its own procurement, each of which has its own approach to design, each of which has its own team. Uh, and we create through that method a series of peaks and troughs in delivery, uh, which are inherently inefficient. Big startup costs for the project team, big wind down costs at the end, a lot of that expertise, you know, it was interesting, an awful lot of the staff delivering the electrification on the ENG were actually weekend commuters from uh, from, from across uh, GB and elsewhere who came up for the weekend, did a bit of work, went went back for the week. So we weren't creating that sustainable employment that, that's actually really valuable in its own right. So, so the rolling program is key, intelligent engineering is key. Uh, and delivering it in a manner that minimizes the disruption to existing uh, passenger and freight traffic is also utterly vital. So, um, uh, but, I, but I am really heartened by uh, the response to my colleagues in Network Rail in Scotland uh, to the challenge that we have set them. And, and um, you know, it is, it, is, it is, I'm really proud to be a part of the Team Scotland that is taking this challenge on. Um, so uh, the, 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 the other challenge we can't escape from is the affordability challenge. Um, so uh, if we can deliver the electrification efficiently, then 200 million a year ought to deliver the scale of electrification we need by the time we need it. Um, uh, and that sort of money is more or less in keeping with the money we have spent historically on, on railway investment in Scotland. If we allow those costs to run away, or if we allow the program to create peaks and troughs, we won't be able to afford it. Uh, uh, and and uh, we won't be able to afford the cash, but in terms of societal impact, we can't afford not to do that. And here's a, here's a thought that really focuses our mind. Um, I talked about that diesel dilemma, you know, diesels at the minute are good because they get people out of cars and, um, and on trains. Uh, but we know the age of our existing diesel train fleet and we're not we're not going to want to have to buy new diesels uh when the hsts come to the end of their life in 10 years time or when the 156s you know come to the end of their life probably a little bit before that so we have to focus on giving ourselves the opportunity to buy the most efficient trains to replace those diesels we won't be able to buy new diesels that i don't think will be legally permissible um uh we could i suppose buy fuel cell trains and battery trains but they are more expensive uh and they don't work quite as well uh and we are committing ourselves then to an ongoing higher subsidy for railway and that again isn't sustainable so so it's that it's that sort of asset replacement for the rolling stock which drives us to realize we need to be electrifying key routes now to be ready to buy the right train in 10 years time I think that um, comes into a question that we've had here from um, Aidan McIsaac, which is saying that why was or, or still is 
the real focus on, on ScotRail on um, the HSTs given the economic and environmental impact and, and operational implications um, in terms of fuel um, and older fleet technical instance emissions and, and asking wouldn't it have been better to invest in bi-mode rolling stock or or, um, or having made the 385's bi-mode um, and, and then, then on to better well, investment and more sustainable alternatives for the future. So well, we're, we're, we're a bit back to the magic money tree thing, aren't we? Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, there are always there are always other things we could buy, but there's only so much to go around. And and the the real challenge of of railway policy and uh, railway engineering railway operation is to get the most for the money that we have. And uh, why have we gone for HSTs? Because we want to get people out of cars. They are uh, passengers love them. Uh, so we had severe overcrowding issues on uh, the Highland Main Line, for example, on the Class 170 diesels we were running. Uh, and the HSTs offer us longer trains. They offer us faster trains. They offer us more comfortable trains. Uh, and what I really want to do is get people off the A9 to Inverness uh, and off the trunk road to Aberdeen uh, and into the high speed trains. Uh, and therefore, they are an environmental asset for the time being. What I don't want to do uh, is to place reliance upon them forever, and that's why we have to plan for their efficient uh, replacement. So rather, say so, no, I will spend the money on the wiring on the route to Aberdeen, uh, rather than spend the money on expensive bi-mode trains now, because that takes me to a long-run, sustainable, efficient solution. I'm just aware of the time that we've got two minutes left and there's still quite a lot of um, of questions to get through. So I just so, want to pick out a couple of, of themes. Um, so if, if, if it helps, I'm, I'm, I'm up for a little longer, I, I, I'm, um, uh, uh, if, if that suits, but I don't want to detain and bore other people. Um, people are people are willing, uh, happy to, to drop out when they can. I'm, I'm certainly happy to chat for another 10 minutes if, if people stay on. Um, but I, I think pulling out a couple of um, themes that have come out. There's, there's a little bit on, on how joined up. Um, the thinking is that, that as you're going towards electrification, um, a couple of questions on, on how aligned this is with renewable energy and speaking to energy companies and um, considering the potential demand for electricity through a fully, fully electric trail, um, I'll talk now, um, a fully <laughs> electrified rail network um, and, and the, obviously the, the large amount of, of electricity that that will require. Yeah, um, Re so really, re a really good question. So, um, uh, I mean, I did mention that Scottish government's policy of pursuing sustainable energy generation is part of what informs our commitment to electrification as well. Uh, so, so I mean, that's a I did, it's just worth remembering things like fuel cells um, are only about 27%, 28% efficient in energy terms uh, so um, you know from the, the energy generated to the creation of the hydrogen to the compression and storage and transport all of that soaks up a lot of energy before you can get to put it into the into the fuel cell itself so um, uh, so so electrification is an inherently energy efficient technology um, but we have to have enough of it uh, uh, you, you may or may not know that Network Rail is the single largest purchaser of electricity in uh, in Britain. Um, uh, and actually, back to one of those earlier questions, what are the key challenges? The uh, the supply point challenge is often on the critical path for our electrification uh, program. So we can put the wires up faster than we can build the feeder stations because some of those. Uh, and that's there's a if you forgive me I will I will be uh, boringly technical but it's quite important. Um, so the 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 high power distribution system in electricity across Great Britain is a three phase system, but uh, uh, above each each track on a 25,000 volt railway you will only see a single wire, which means we have a single phase supply. Uh, and uh, not only is that a single phase rather than three phases. Uh, it is a very peaky demand. You know, it's uh, a lot of power when a train accelerates, and then not much for five or ten minutes till the next one comes, depending on which railway you're on. 
Uh, now, what do what does electricity supply network like? It likes balanced loads across all three phases, and it likes to avoid big peaks. It likes nice steady loads. So trains are just about as nasty an electrical load as you can as you can imagine. Um, and we can smooth that out a bit with things like uh, regenerative braking, but but there there is tantalisingly the prospect of developments in power electronics giving us alternatives to the classic single phase transformer. You could put three phases in and get a single phase out, which is the reverse of what we do on trains now, uh, where you put a single phase in and create three phases to drive an induction motor. So. Um, if that technology evolves, it's a bit of a game changer because it allows us to have a larger number of smaller feeders and the places where we can supply the network become easier to find because we're not looking for access to the supergrid. Uh, so I didn't, don't know if I quite answered the question, but in answer to the real question I was posed, yes, we understand that and yes, we are engaged with the electricity supply industry and exactly those issues as indeed is my colleague, our director of uh, low carbon transport and transport Scotland, working out how to electrify the road network. And uh, only yesterday, uh, chief executive of one of the Scottish power companies was explaining that you know we had asked them to put in rapid charges for electric cars uh, uh, at the south end of the A9 road between the Central Belt and uh, and, and and Inverness. And he worked out it would be something like uh, uh, 30 million to supply the feeder station just for about 30 rapid charges. And you just think, oh, crikey. Yeah, that's so that challenge affects the road network as well as the rail network. And making certain we have enough power is important. Luckily, uh, Scotland is a net exporter of electricity. So um, we've got a lot of wind and a lot of waves. Um, uh, and that adds up to a lot of electricity. Yeah, I um I won't I won't digress because I'm I'm interested in in that uh, those questions and whether you'd want distributed generation and and whether the railway should be supplying some of its own electricity and oh brilliant questions that sounds like another lecture no let's when, uh, when, let's move on to when, some questions when that you are organise in the chat. that lecture please send me an invite I'd like to listen um so. There's a question here from um, Andrew Harries, which came through, and and he says to put a fine point on it. What have the Scots got so right that the English have got so wrong? Um, I don't know whether that's come from an English or a Scottish perspective. So uh, I, I'll let you deal with that one. Um, uh, I, I will. I, I couldn't. I'm afraid I. Uh, I have been critical of the design of the uh, of the electrification in England, but frankly, there I'm. I am criticising fellow rail professionals for having allowed that to happen, rather than that being a national observation. Um, uh, I will forbear from comment on the policies of another government, because all I would say to people who criticise government is it's it's an awful lot easier to criticise government than it is to do it, uh, and the complexity that the UK government deals with is uh, is not trifling. But what what have we got right? I think in in Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government, we understand that the rail industry structure is, well, mad, frankly, um, uh, because it's separated out things that are better managed together. And, and bizarrely, the profit and loss account of Scotland's railway comes together on my desk as a senior civil servant. Um, now, by accident, I happen to have a background in the railway industry. Um, uh, which perhaps gives me a fighting chance, but that's not a sustainable model, I think. Uh, and I think that um, uh, we understand that the railway needs to be joined up and managed as a system, and we understand that we have to connect costs with revenues. Uh, and my recommendation to any government would firstly be to organise a railway system in a way that railway professionals realise that and manage that for themselves. But to the extent that you've created a railway system where that isn't possible, uh, then you have to step up to the mark and um, uh, and do that joining up and do that strategic leadership in partnership yeah. with your rail delivery partners. I think um, maybe that ties into a question here from Ricardo de Mertes, which says, to what extent do you think the successful track record of, of Scottish electrification is attributable to the alliance model, um, promoting coordination and, and whether that one-to-one -one interface is, is more suitable for delivering. 
decarbonisation. Alliances mean all sorts of things to all sorts of people. So you might mean the ScotRail alliance, which exists between Network Rail and ScotRail. Uh, you might mean the alliance that existed in alliance contracting model between Network Rail and some of its contracting partners. Um, uh, uh, so I'm not quite sure which sort of alliance it's it's being asked about. What what I would say is this: um, because railways are a system, uh, partnership and teamwork are essential, uh, where we learn together and identify the optimal solutions together and understand each other's problems and work to realise the opportunities that 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 shared understanding can create. So that that we talk about Team Scotland, it's not just a slogan. It's how we think, it's how we work, and it makes a real difference, and, it, and it's really important to us. Um, when it comes to alliancing in major... Well, I think a common here, sorry, saying that it is the Scott Rail Alliance. Um, that, oh, that well, Ricardo... well and, and I think that's, that's, that, that's very helpful. Um, I am perhaps less positive about innovative procurement technologies. In fact, when someone comes to me and says they've got a world-class, a new and innovative world-class approach to procurement, for uh, an infrastructure project, I tend to reach for my metaphorical resolver because um, uh, I've never known those work frightfully well. Uh, so, so do the do the ordinary things well rather than add unnecessary complexity is also a pretty good lesson from experience, I would say. Okay, um, we've we've come to the end of the extra ten minutes, and we've still got fifty six people, which is um, very impressive. Thank right. you all for your, right. your time, your interest. Um, I've not been able to get through all of the questions, so I'm just trying to find um, one to to finish on. Um, I think there's been a couple of questions from a few people here um, about hydrogen and and, and battery um, technologies. I know you're saying electrification is preferable. But in that decarbonisation yeah. plan, there are routes that are not viable and they will be using um, autonomous yeah. traction. Um, so I suppose it's a bit of a question on that, saying which do you think are the most um, you know, feasible, which, which are going to be, which of those technologies will be used? Um, and, and maybe a little bit about why it's not feasible to electrify um, everywhere. I think that covers the questions here so, from a few uh, people. Uh, so I, I think you know a swift reprise of the technologies um uh battery technology has come on a long way uh and is quite credible and some folk may remember that the uh the late lamented uh, royal d side line from aberdeen south uh, uh um uh, was operated with a battery powered uh, multiple unit in the 1960s so it's not exactly new technology for scotland um but the uh the, the the tantalizing technology is the battery added to the electric multiple unit where in essence you charge the battery while it's under the wires and then run the distance in between we will buy some of those uh we are we are consulting with rolling stock suppliers at the minute about options there's an interesting question about how many and what the balance is but they are a hugely useful transition technology however far we've got the wires until we've got our optimal network there's always tantalizing the next bit that we cut <laughs> that we can't run the electric train to uh and uh so i have no doubt whatsoever that um battery electric trains will be an important part of our transition planning and ultimately will form part of our final final network mix uh um but just remember batteries are expensive and they're heavy uh, and they have a finite life and in and and they use some some quite scarce resources too so so you know they are they are useful but they are not uh they are not uh without their own challenges fuel cell technology is promising we don't see uh, 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 uh we don't see an alternative for the use of fuel cells for a number of roles in road transport for example things that we're already looking at uh, uh hydrogen powered municipal fleets like dust carts and um snow plows and all those sorts of things and gritters those are things that we think there's a there's a there's a credible technology i suspect <coughs> there are some eternal verities in in um in railway investment and and you know go back to the original mcclellan reports and some of the original reports into electrification and if you've not read those i recommend them there you know, go and have a look at the report commission for the Northeastern Railway. It's still a cracker in about 1920. Um, but the the essence is that you put capital in up front 
to deliver the power supply uh, and you get uh, a lower cost of operation and a lower cost of trains as a result of that capital that you put in. That works where you have got uh, busier networks and higher revenue that justifies that that investment. Um, when I look at you know the far north line with its four trains a day to Wick and Thurso, uh, uh, though I am ambitious for reduction in the cost of electrification, I'm perhaps not that ambitious. Uh, and I think we will need to find an alternative uh, uh, solution for those longer distance, lower traffic intensity routes. But I, I think I have probably realized more than I expected to even five years ago, the extent to which electrification is now the necessary technology for routes that I might once have, you know, uh, have, have, have uh, thought of more of a gleam in the eye. And it's just an interesting thought, isn't it, that it is cheaper to electrify a mile of single track railway than it is to double that railway. And why does that matter? Well, um, uh, on single track railways, track occupancy determines capacity. If I can get a train over the heavy gradients of the Highland Main Line more quickly because it's got more power, uh, then I can get more traffic over that single track railway and maybe I don't have to double it. So that's that's quite quite an interesting bit of the mix yeah definitely um like i said there, there are a couple more questions and I'm, i apologize that we've, we've not had time to get through them all there's been there's been so many um but thank you will for a, a fascinating talk thank you for staying on um to answer as many of those questions well, as, as you did. um thank you to all of our attendees um, it's been really interesting and we, we definitely had um, had a mix of people from around the country. Um, Andrew Harry said that that was an English question um, about what have the Scots, <laughs> Scots done better from an English perspective. Well, um, so it's can great. I, can I be permitted one, one last comment? Yes. Um, so, so look, um, uh, many years ago, let's not dwell on just how many, I was a young rail professional too, though you may find that hard to believe. Um, uh, and and all I would say to, to those of you pursuing your careers is uh, what we do in Scotland is exciting. I am I am very proud to be a part of Team Scotland. Uh, it is a tremendous privilege to be a part of Team Scotland. Uh, and we do crack on and do things that other people just talk about. So to all of you who are interested and have an appetite, uh, uh, then I'd say uh, do please consider uh, pursuing your careers in Scotland because it's a lot of fun. And the basic deal is the work is brilliant, uh, the people and places are brilliant, the weather is awful and the whiskey is the compensation. Come and join us. <laughs> Thanks for that, Bill. You said it much better than, than I ever could. Um, no, thank you. Thank you very much um, for that talk. Um, it's, it's been brilliant. Um, we encourage anyone who's, who's participated who maybe hasn't signed up on the, the new website, which was launched in June, to do that. And we have our social media platform um, running on there and um, all news and events and our, our upcoming um, events will be posted on there as well. So we hope to see you in the future. Um, and with that, I will um, try and remember how to stop the webinar, which is the trouble that I have all the time. Um, but once again, thank you everyone um, and thank you, Bill. And thank you for organizing it, absolutely delighted. Thank Cheers. you, bye Bill, bye everyone. <laughs>